Okay, this video is on one of the most famous examples of slavery, and that is the transatlantic slave trade. It's one of the most famous and one of the most influential types of slavery, especially in understanding the modern world in which we live in today. So what exactly is the transatlantic slave trade? The name transatlantic slave trade tells you what it is. Transcend the Atlantic slave trade. So a slave trade which transcended the Atlantic Ocean. African people, Europeans would go to the African coast and they would trade with Africans. And amongst the commodities that Africans would sell to the Europeans would be other Africans who would provide slave labor. These people would be put on ships. It's estimated that at least 12 million would be put on European ships on the coast of Africa to be sent to the Americas, either North America, South America, or the Caribbean island. Two million would die on the route to get to the Americas because of the horrendous conditions in which they were packed on these ships. When they finally reached, it's estimated that at least 10 million arrived alive. So in a period from the 1500s to the 1800s, 300 years, at least 10 million Africans were transported from Africa to a different continent, either North America, South America, or the Caribbean islands. One of the largest systems of mass migration of human beings ever. And that's what we're looking at in this video. Now, this does not mean or imply that this is the only form of slavery or the only form of mass system of slavery. There are other examples. This video is not about the trans-Saharan slave trade. It is not about various other types of Arab slave trade, where Arabs would come and buy slaves from Africa and send them to the Middle East to work as slave labor. This is specifically on this type of slavery. Again, in human history, all types of people had been slaves historically. All types of people had owned slaves. You've had Europeans who had been slaves. You've had Europeans who had owned slaves. You've had Africans who had been slaves. You had Africans who had owned slaves. You had Asians who had been slaves. You had Asians who had owned slaves. It's existed historically. The focus of this video is why did this system of slavery where 10 million Africans were transported from one continent to another to work as slave labor, how did it come about and what was its impact? So mainly focusing on how, as a consequence of the age of European exploration, did this system of slavery, mass system of slavery, in which 10 million people were transported to another continent to work as slave labor. That's the focus. Okay, so the transatlantic slave trade. Again, sometimes it's called, okay, so transatlantic slave trade transcend the Atlantic Ocean, a slave trade that transcended the Atlantic Ocean. Sometimes, depending on what sources you read, it'll be called the triangular slave trade because you have a triangle system of slaves. So we'll start with Europe. From Europe, European goods would be transported from Europe to Africa. And the Europeans would bring these goods and they would trade with Africans and the Africans would give them African goods amongst though that would be human beings as slaves then those Africans would be transported across the Atlantic Ocean to work in the Americas, South America, North America, Caribbean islands. They would work on plantations which would produce sugar, tobacco, cotton, various other types of raw resources, which would then be transported across the Atlantic again back to Europe, where Europeans would manufacture goods and then trade those goods back to Africa. Then those Africans would be sent to the Americas and then raw resources back to Europe, manufactured goods back to Africa, and you've got a triangle system of slavery that's existed. Okay, so that in a nutshell is what the transatlantic slave trade is. Very important for our modern world because they say 10 million people from one continent forcibly transported to another continent. So highly influential, impactful in the world we live in today. The transatlantic slave trade, some characteristics took place from the 16th to the 19th century, the 1500s to the 1800s. Why did it begin in the 1500s? Well, it began because this was the age in which two very important things happened at the same time, well, two types of European exploration, both for the same purpose. So the Spanish wanted to find a route under Christopher Columbus, wanted to sail around the Atlantic Ocean, come around the world and get to the east where there's a lot of lucrative uh, commodities, black pepper, ma uh, mace, um, cinnamon, etc. Very, very valuable at this point in time. The Portuguese also wanted to do that, but they wanted to sail down the Atlantic Ocean, round Africa, through the Indian Ocean to get to the east that way. Now, Christopher Columbus thought that the Earth, sorry, is much smaller than it actually is, 
and he made a lot of promises to a lot of people who believed in him that he would get to the east, bring these eastern commodities back to Europe, and it would create a lot of wealth. Instead, the wealth was much bigger than he thought it was, and he accidentally stumbled across the Caribbean islands and two new continents. Well, he, he didn't necessarily discover everything, but his voyage would lead to the discovery of South America, North America, and the Caribbean islands. And the promises of all the spices and things that he would bring back would not be fulfilled. However, there was another opportunity to make money in the Americas. You got all this very fertile land that you could grow crops, planta plantations, and you could generate vast amounts of profit, but it requires labor. We'll explain how Africans ended up becoming that system of labor. So that's why the transatlantic slave trade began in the 1500s. And then it ended in the 1800s, because by the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution had taken place. Slave labor is no longer as important as it once was. And various European countries began to question the morality of forced slave labor. And led by Great Britain, they began to abolish first the slave trade and then slavery altogether. So it began in the 1500s, as a consequence of the age of European exploration, picked up during the 1600s with the involvement of the Dutch East India Company, peaked during the 1700s, began to fade in the 1800s with Britain ending firstly the slave trade and secondly slavery in all its colonies. However, even after the British abolished it in the middle of the 1800s, it still continued illegally. It continued illegally up until the 1880s, and it was only abolished in 1888 when, Portug when the Portuguese colony of Brazil finally uh, made slavery illegal. Okay, origins of slavery, right? So again, transatlantic slave trade, system of slavery where Europeans would come to the east, or oh, sorry, the west coast of Africa, buy slaves from other Africans, put those slaves on ships, transport them across the Atlantic Ocean, to the Americas where they would work as slave labor. Once they arrive in the Americas, it would be rigid. I mean, if you are in the Americas and you're African, it's because you're a slave. That's how it ended up being. So it ended up becoming very, very rigid. It was a type of chattel slavery where the, those slaves had absolutely no rights and the children would be born as slaves. Very, very brutal type of slavery. Origins. Before 1500s, it was by no means obvious that Africa would become a source of human labor for a mass system of plantations that would develop across the Atlantic Ocean in the American continents. This took place due to a variety of factors. Now, again, from today's vantage point, you might say, okay, we know that we had this history of slavery in which Africans, millions of them, were taken as slaves and seen as slaves, and it led to racism and various things developing in the Americas, and then it was followed by colonialism, and we kind of take that for granted. But if you were to go back in time in the 1500s, there's no sense of that necessarily. As I say, any types of people could have become slaves. If Christopher Columbus and his crew were captured by pirates, they could have been captured and forced to work as slaves in some Mediterranean islands. So this developed because of a variety of factors. And looking at those factors is what's the focus of this video. Um, it also, when the Europeans first started to visit the West Coast of Africa, they did not come as superiors because they were not at that stage. They did not have modern machinery or machine guns or anything that could make them feel superior. They arrived as equal trading partners with the Africans who they came into contact with and they traded. They gave European goods, Africans gave African goods. However, in Africa, there was a lot of slavery. The um, various wars, prisoners of wars would be captured and sold as slaves. Criminals would be sold as slaves, and they would sell these to Europeans. As the slave trade increased, then certain individuals in, on the continent would specialize in going out and capturing slaves to supply the huge demand for slave labor. Slavery existed in many parts of the world for thousands of years, Maybe for as long as there had been civilization, there had been slaves. Um, with the Neolithic Revolution, with the Agricultural Revolution, where human beings stopped becoming hunter-gatherers, started to live in large, dense concentrations, of inequality naturally emerges, and sometimes they're slaves. Whenever two kingdoms go to war with one another, the losers would often be captured and forced into slave labor. It's just part of the human condition. When Portuguese explorers began searching for a sea route to India following the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the aim of finding India was clearly a long-term goal. 
A more immediate goal was bypassing Muslim North Africa and gaining direct access to the gold producing West Africa. Okay, so uh, this relates partly to the other video on the arrival of Europeans in Southern Africa, where I go into a bit more detail about this, but I'll just brush through this quickly. 1453, you had the fall of Constantinople, the rise of the Ottoman Empire, huge Muslim empire between Europe and the East, and makes trade more and more difficult. Okay, so to try and get very, very valuable black pepper and other spices from the East, it's going to be very challenging if you depend on land routes. However, if you can find a sea route, and if you're a European country, you'll be able to generate vast amounts of profit because black pepper at this point in time is worth more than gold per its weight. So whichever European country could find a sea route to get to the Far East or to India, Indonesia, they would be able to generate vast amounts of money. But the Portuguese, okay, so Columbus, we know he thought he could sail around the Atlantic, get to the, um, the East that way, underestimated the size of the world. And the Portuguese had a different plan. They wanted to go around Africa, but that was their long-term goal. So the short-term goal was to trade with Africans to generate money. So if you look at a map of Africa, you'll see a defining feature is the Sahara Desert, which separates North Africa from Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa below the Sahara Desert, had always been a mystery to Europeans. They had not been visiting, etc. But now, on their route to get to the east, they're going to begin an age of exploration, and they're going to start sailing down the Atlantic and start coming to contact with these people who they had not come into contact with previously. Indirectly, goods made their way to Europe from Sub-Saharan Africa and from and uh, from Sub from Europe back to Sub-Saharan Africa because the North Africans who lived in obviously North Africa, served as intermediaries. They would take European goods, bring it down to Sub-Saharan Africa, take Sub-Saharan African goods, bring, take it up to Europe, but obviously they're kind of the middleman, so they make a profit. So if the Portuguese could bypass the middleman, come directly to the west coast of Africa, trade directly with the source of these African goods, they could get them at cheaper prices. And they knew that Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, was a source of gold. So this is their short-term goal, to make use of this um, African goods to go back to Europe, generate profits, send a bigger expedition, for, sail further down Africa, get more African goods, go back to Europe, uh, and finance further expeditions until they eventually discover how big the African continent is, sail around it, get to the east, get spices and various other things from the east, come back to Europe, and generate vast amounts of profit. Sub-Saharan Africa had an established reputation as a source of gold. This would be very beneficial to the small, not well-endowed Portugal. Gold would help fund further exploration past the southern tip of Africa. So again, Portugal, not a, a very small country, not rich in any resources itself, no diamonds, no gold, etc. But they could sail to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is known for gold, get trade with Africans, get this gold, send it back to Europe. They can make profits, which they can then use to finance further expeditions further down the west coast of Africa until they find a route to the east. In 1470s, Portuguese sailing ships bypassed the Akhan gold fields, the Gold Coast, which is today known as the country of Ghana. They built a fort, Almina, to protect their post from rival shipping. Okay, so they would bring copper, cloth, and brass in exchange for gold. They provided the people, the West Africans, with goods that they originally got from the trans-Saharan trade. So again, uh, North Africans who had domesticated the camel would bring these European goods to Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, now, the people of the West Africa are getting them directly from Portugal, so th they can buy it for cheaper. The Portuguese explorers were not able to colonize or subjugate African societies at this time. They acted as equal trading partners. They had goods needed by Africans, and Africans had goods which they needed. Again, by the, in this stage of world history, there's no sense of superiority. Uh, equal trading partners, right? There's no machine guns. There's nothing that makes the Portuguese feel superior. Okay, so they come and they trade. By the 1500s, Portuguese brought new goods obtained from the Indian Ocean trade and trade with Africa increased, all right? Again, I go into more detail on this in the other video, but they eventually established a sea route to get to the east, and then they would bring eastern goods to Africa and further trade would develop. 
So if you look at a map, you can see this is kind of what was the Mediterranean world if you, in this map. Uh, this is what Europe knew. They had lots of interaction with North Africa. They knew about Egypt, Tunisia, you know, Carthage had fought Rome in, uh, over 2,000 years ago. So North Africa, well known. Sahara Desert's here. What's beyond the Sahara Desert? They know there's people there. They get things from those people like gold, but they never actually had direct contact with those people. Right? They've always depended on North Africa. But now you see this Ottoman Empire, which is emerged over here, conquers North Africa and blocks up the Middle East. Ottoman Empire, today the country of Turkey, back then the Ottoman Empire, the, they had in 1453 overthrown the last Christian stronghold, Constantinople. So when the Roman Empire had fallen, you had the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire had fallen much earlier. The Eastern Old Roman Empire continued to flourish by a different name, the Byzantine Empire, and it was a Christian stronghold until the Ottomans sacked it, destroyed it, it created the Ottoman Empire, and now you've got a hostile Muslim, I say hostile because the Muslims and the Christians are enemies at this time, at this stage, here, so the Europeans now need to look for an alternative route to get to the East, and the Portuguese are going to sail down the west coast of Africa. So again, if you look at this map, you can see Bartolomeu Diaz and Vasco da Gama, the sea route that they want to establish, go around the west coast of here, start get trading with West Africans, take those goods back to Europe, generate more profits and a further expedition. Diego Cao will eventually come to the mouth of the Congo River. He would go back. Bartolomeu Diaz would make it all the way to southern Africa. He would go back. Vasco da Gama would get a route to the east. But all this time, the coastal regions at least, uh, Portuguese are stopping off, making relations with the Africans who live there, trading with the Africans, getting things from Africans, and a trade network is being established. This is the Fort Almina, which the Portuguese established to protect their commodities from other European shipping. Now, amongst the items for trade with the Portuguese, Africans had gold, so they would give that to the Portuguese. They had ivory, which they give to the Portuguese. They had diamonds, and they also had slaves, human beings. Okay, in Africa, lots of empires. Empires conquer other peoples. Whenever you have one empire conquering other people, what happens to the people who get conquered? Sometimes they're taken as slaves. Okay, so there is slavery that's practiced in West Africa. So when these Europeans come, they, amongst the goods that they will give them, they will sell them slaves. Now, from today's vantage point, people might say, why would they sell their people to Europeans as slaves? But you have to understand that there's no sense of these are our people. If you're an ethnic group or a kingdom, the neighbor, your neighbor is your historical enemy. Just like if you go to Europe leading up to World War I, the French and the Germans, they were enemies. There was like, oh, we're European. You know, we, we, are, we are historical enemies with two separate nations. Same thing in Africa at this time. So whenever you had large wars, the loser or the, uh, the kingdom that gets conquered, often you'd have war captives who would be slaves. Also prisoners sometimes would be taken as slaves. However, slavery in Africa would be slightly different because you might be born a slave, but maybe you could attain freedom. Some of the most significant people historically in human history have been born slaves, but the chattel slave trade that's about to, or the chattel slavery that's about to take place now is going to be very different, and we'll get to that now. During the 1480s, the Portuguese had discovered and colonized the islands of Principe and Seo Tome. So now the 1480s, okay, this is before, just before Bartolomeu Diaz reaches South Africa. So while they're exploring the west coast of Africa, they come into contact with these two islands, which are just off the west coast, Seo Tome and Principe, and no one lives there. Now remember, why did Portugal not colonize Africa? Because obviously they couldn't. They couldn't just come in and try and colonize uh, the people of Sub-Saharan Africa. There's powerful armies there. Uh, it would be impossible. But the islands of Seatome and Princip are unoccupied. It's vacant. So the Portuguese could create plantations on it they, where they could grow sugar cane. But where they're going to get labor? Now, in th this point in time, you can create plantations, but how will you make it profitable? If you buy or if you import workers and workers, you've got to pay them. It's going to be very expensive. You're not going to create profit but they would use slave labor, okay? So remember, they were uh, trading with Africans and the Africans on the West Coast were providing them with a number of 
things, and amongst the stuff that they would provide them would be slave labors. So they would put those slaves to work on, say, a Toma and Princip, and it proved to be very successful. Sugar was originally grown by the Spanish and the Portuguese in the Mediterranean islands and in southern Spain and Portugal during the 14th and 15th century. So during the 1300s and the 1400s, or the 14th and 15th century, the Portuguese and the Spanish had experimented with growing sugarcane on the islands on the Mediterranean. These were a major supplier to the European market. To make these plantations profitable, slave labor was used. A large proportion of Portugal's population of slaves were from North Africa and Eastern Europe. In fact, the word slave comes from the word Slav. Uh, Slavic people of Eastern Europe, the ethnic group is the Slav, so there was this association with them being slaves. So the Portuguese have some experience with growing a very lucrative cash crop known as sugarcane through the use of slave labor, and they experimented with these two vacant islands, say Otoma and Princip, but this time they used African labor since they're now in direct contact with Africans. Previously, they had used North African slaves or they had used Eastern European slaves. As trade with West Africa increased, and since African leaders provided slaves for trade, these slaves began to be used both in European sugar plantations and the two islands, there, Princip and Seotome. Okay, So uh, again with the map, you can see that the Portuguese who came across these islands, they have some experience growing sugar cane, so they use the islands to grow sugar canes, generate profits, and Africans who are on the west coast will be shipped to work on these plantations. Okay, the early 16th century, Seotome became the largest single producer of sugar for the European market. Senegal and Gambia sourced the slaves to Portugal and Spain. Those from the Niger Delta and the Congo River were taken to Seotome. Okay. Now, while the Portuguese were doing this journey to get to uh, the India and they were exploring West Africa and coming across two uninhabited islands where they were growing plantations, the Spanish were doing something different. Spain paved the way for the Americas. In 1492, you know, Christopher Columbus, he went, traveled, discovered the Americas by accident. Um, searching for a route to the east, to India, sailed west, Caribbean islands, sailed west, thought he could reach the Indies, so he called it the West Indies. Demand for labor on gold and silver mines in the mainland and tobacco plantations on the islands. 1500, okay, so, just, just jumping ahead here. So now, there are silver mines they you know gradually the spanish go in and they start conquering uh there's silver mines and there is gold mines and they start growing plantations tobacco plantations and they try to start enslaving the local people now here the conditions are different there's various different types of native americans uh the, the people that columbus first came into contact with were very passive types of native americans who are very welcoming of columbus to their detriment, unfortunately. You've had different types of Native Americans. You've had the Aztecs, the Incas, you had last standing armies, you've had nomadic people in the north, etc. So let's not generalize. But one thing that they we can generalize is that they didn't have an immunity to European diseases, old world diseases. If you look at a map, you see that North the world, Africa, Europe, Asia are connected. Americas, Australia are separate. So the people who developed, like the Aboriginal Australians and the Native Americans, developed to a large extent separately from the old world. And when diseases like smallpox, influenza came from animals like cattle and pigs, chickens, humans who had those animals, who lived in the old world continents, gradually as time goes on, develop an immunity to those diseases. As uh, thousands of years pass, those diseases become, they start evolving, but humans' immune systems start evolving as well. But now when you have a new contact, people from the old world, whose bodies have an immunity to such diseases, but they carry those diseases and take it to the new world. And these people, suddenly, they, their ancestors have not be, ever been exposed to these diseases. They are very vulnerable to it, and they die in large numbers. So in the Americas, it's not an intentional genocide, but there's like a type of genocide that's taking place. So obviously, the Portuguese want to create slave labor. Native Americans are not necessarily going to be a good well, they're not going to be able to resist Portuguese subjugation. Oh, sorry, not Portuguese, Spanish subjugation. Portuguese will go to Brazil, but Spanish subjugation because they're fighting while they're dying in large numbers due to sickness. Things like horse, horses, they've never seen them before. The Spanish on horseback. It's, it's a very different, um, like, different world in which they lived in, in the New World. So w during this contact, many died in large numbers. And 
there would not be an effective labor force or slave labor force. If the Spanish tried to enslave them, they could easily conquer them now because of the large numbers dying due to diseases. But they couldn't enslave them because when they would enslave them, the slaves would not last long. They would die very quickly and they wouldn't provide an effective labor force. Portugal will also get involved in this plantations in the Americas. In 1500, a Portuguese ship en route to India was blown off course and the crew accidentally ended up in South America. They named the land Brazil and soon established massive plantations which would require huge amounts of labor. So they landed on Brazil and come in contact with Native Americans, but they would see, wow, very good, nice environment where you could grow huge plantations, crops generate vast amounts of profit again. To work the mines and the plantations while creating profits, the Portuguese and the Spanish tried to enslave local Native Americans. However, Native Americans had no immunity to European Old World diseases. Now, just some stats to show you how rapid this rate of uh, death was because of a lack of immunity to Old World diseases. Within the first century, it's estimated that 90% of the Caribbean in inhabitants had died. During the same century, half of Brazil's population had also died. So like from the period of the 1500s when the Spanish and the Portuguese began arriving, 90% of the Caribbean people died and half of the Brazilian people died because of these diseases, which, you know, the impact cannot be um, overestimated. You, it was great. Now, because of this, now, again, the Spanish are creating plantations, the Portuguese are creating plantations, and they are trying to make use of the silver mines. You know, they, in order to maximize profits, you can't get, send workers who need to be paid, so you need slave labor to generate profits. So they took criminals and outcasts from Europe by the early 1500s, but it simply wasn't enough, and they were also vulnerable to tropical diseases. So they took basically European slaves or European indentured laborers to the Americas, and they were not the best labor force, okay? They, they did have an immunity to old world diseases, but in the tropical environment, you know, the heat and sun and stuff, they would not, they were not also very effective and they will also um, be affected. So their mortality much better than Native Americans, but still not ideal. Now, amongst the goods that the Portuguese were getting from Africans who lived on the West Coast were African slaves, and they started to experiment with African slaves. And African slaves, turned out to be the best suited for the working conditions in the Americas. They lived in similar climatic conditions in Central Africa. And they had immunity to a lot of, well, not a, a full immunity, but they had a lot of contact, better immunity to a lot of tropical diseases like malaria, etc. So they ended up being the best suited. So it's kind of to their detriment that they were, in a way, you could think of the toughest in, in terms of this type of um, labor, but it would be to their detriment. Africans were better suited for climate and had experience in agriculture and metal working, the stuff that the Native Americans didn't. Remember, Native Americans who lived in the New Worlds would had never come into contact with horses, and a lot of the Old World skills that the Portuguese and the Spanish required, the African slaves had those. Mortality amongst African slaves was consequently lower than other slaves' options. In addition, on the African coast, there were abundance of slave captors after offer. There was also no shot in with Europe, there were a limited amount of European slaves. But when they would stop off at the west coast of Africa, at first it seemed like there was an unlimited amount of slaves that Africans were willing to sell to the Europeans. So they would take advantage of that. So the transatlantic slave trade, you can say it really begins with the transatlantic slave trade of shipping Africans across to the Americas in 1532, 1532 years after Jesus. Um, the first or just about 500 years ago from today, the first slaves were taken to the Americas. Their numbers remained small but steady up until the 1630s as the Dutch, then French, and British became involved in sugar in the Caribbean and Brazil. Next 200 years saw the largest scale of forced transportation of captive people in history. So when the Portuguese and the Spanish were involved, the slave trade was limited, but other European countries followed suit. So the Dutch would eventually do what the um, Portuguese did by going to the east and uh, Indonesia and colonizing parts of there for spices. The British would follow suit. They'd start to colonize India. They would also come to the Americas and start colonizing as well. The Pope made a deal with Portugal and Spain 
dividing half of the world for Portugal, half of the world for Spain, the rest of Europe was not on board with that. They did as they pleased and they got involved. And as they got involved, the demand for slave labor increased. So again, triangle trade map, you can see the triangle trade, plantation crops sent from the Americas to Europe. So the African slaves who work there produce raw crops sent to Europe, manufactured goods sent from Europe to Africa. The Africans would sell Europeans, other Africans as slaves. They will be transported to South America, the Caribbean islands in North America, where they will work as plantation labor, sorry, slave labor on the plantations. Uh, just some facts about the nature of the slave trade. At least 10 million arrived as slaves, maybe 2 million died on the way, making about 10 million, sorry, making 10 to 12 million in total, all right? So it's estimated. Now, it's, with all the research that individuals have done over the years, best estimates are that at least 12 million at the west coast of Africa were packed onto ships, and at least 10 million made it to the New World uh, alive. 2 million would have died on the journey. Now, it's also estimated that a couple million also died to get to the coast because African slave raiders who now, as European demand for slaves increased, Africans could make a lot of profit if they went and captured slaves. So they would capture slaves in the interior, take them to the coast under also forced uh, conditions. There would also be a lot of death on that journey as well. Um, numbers, 1600s, about 20,000 slaves a year. 1700s, about 50,000 to 100,000. Uh, yeah. Also, I, I do mention in the video description that a reference to these facts and a reference to the slideshow is Kevin Shillington, History of Africa, 7th edition. So um, you can read that chapter on this in more detail as well. Um, a lot of what I'm saying today is based on that chapter in that book, and these stats come from Kevin Shillington. The numbers died by the 1800s but continued until the 1870s and 1880s. Senegal was a major source in the 1600s. Angola remained constant. Caribbean attracted Dutch, French, English, Danish, and other Europeans. Western Nigeria was known as the Slave Coast. By 1700s, the whole African coast from Senegal to Angola became a source of slaves. So all along the west coast of Africa, from as far north as Senegal to as far south as Angola. Not further south than Angola, because further south you in Namibia, and in Namibia, there are the Kwai Kwai, or the, the Heroa, the Nama, various nomadic people who do not keep slaves. There was a time where the Portuguese tried to go into in South Africa, the Cape, and capture Kwai Kwai as slaves themselves. The Portuguese got defeated very badly, and they gave up that. So generally from Angola up until Senegal, that's where Europeans would trade, get slaves, transport them across the Atlantic. Just another map that shows you, again, some of the stats and where the slaves came from and where they went. Between 1650 and 1860, approximately 10 to 50 million slave people were transported from Western Africa to the Americas. Most were shipped to the West Indies, Central America, and South America. Um, just a thing to mention is that even though today everybody talks about the United States of America and its dark slave past and um, uh, you know, they say, oh, the United States of America, African-American slavery. It's important to note that the United States actually had a very small percentage of the total slave population that was taken from Africa. Brazil and the Caribbean islands were actually the highest. And conditions in North America were somewhat better than in Brazil. And like in, obviously, this is chattel slavery. It's horrendous. But slave owners in the Americas try to look after their slaves so that they would have children and the children would be further slave force. Whereas the thinking in Portugal, especially on the sugar plantations, was work the slaves, uh, let them die, you just buy more slaves. They would rather work them to death than look after them and let them have children. So uh, chattel slavery is very, very brutal. But the bulk of slaves who were taken actually went to the Caribbean islands, 4.5 million, as opposed to half a million that went to the Ameri to no uh, sorry the United States, 5 million went to Brazil. It's a picture of what it would have, what a slave purchase might have looked like: European offering a African leader money in exchange for slaves. Now, just some notes on how the actual slave raiding took place. So, how were the slaves captured? Now, Europeans seldom went on slave trading missions themselves. Rather, they traded with Africans for their slaves. 
When Europeans tried to venture into the interior, they were very rarely successful and encountered military defeats and tropical disease. Portuguese, Portuguese were defeated several times in Angola. Um, it's just the period of the 1500s and 1600s, uh, 1700s and up until the 1880s, the vast amount, bulk of the African continent had never been explored by Europeans. They stayed on the coast. The interior was too dangerous for them. Lots of tropical diseases in Africa, which they had not yet had any kind of vaccine for, they would die. Plus, at this point in time, again, in the 1500s, before the Industrial Revolution, it's very unlikely that a European, small European army coming from Europe on a ship would be able to stop off at the west coast of Africa and fight a large African army. It would be impossible. So only with the, maximum, the invention of the Maxim gun by the 18, late 1800s, where, European, where a small European army could defeat a huge African army because they've got a weapon they can fire 500 bullets in a minute. But this is prior to that. So the whole idea of going in and capturing slaves would be almost impossible, but you didn't need to because you could just buy them. So the Africans who lived on the coast were willing to sell slaves to the Europeans. So instead, Europeans built forts on the coast and Africans ventured into the interior, collecting slaves and bringing them to the forts. So as the demand for slave labor increased, more Africans started specializing in providing slave, uh, providing slave labor. Slave, state formation, rise of empires and other political tensions in Africa produced prisoners who could then be given away to Europeans in exchange for goods. State formation and conquest in the interior played an important role in promo promoting the slave market Expanding states led to increased supply to Europeans. But also now, you've got to put yourself in the situation of people living on the coast. They would sell, okay, there was no a sense of we are African, they are Europeans. More the sense of we are the Ashanti, they are our enemies, or we are the Bakongo, that group is not us, they are our enemies. We capture them. The Europeans are actually like our partners, we trade with them. So this whole idea of uh, we are a people, they are taking our people doesn't really exist at that point in time. But some African leaders are beginning to see it that way and they're beginning to be a bit worried. Wait a second, why are so many Europeans buying so many slaves from us? And is this gonna have long-term repercussions? And if you were an African who was reluctant to sell slaves to Europeans, you kind of disadvantage yourself because now Europeans are bringing more and more, the demand for slaves is becoming higher and higher and they're willing to sell more to get them and they'll provide you with guns. So now, if you're at, let's say you are a, society living on the coast and you refuse to trade with the Europeans but your neighbor is willing to trade with the Europeans that means your neighbor is getting European goods including guns and now your neighbor will be better armed than you they can then use those guns attack you sell your people as slaves so it does become a little bit more complicated as time goes on this is not to deny that people on the coast made vast amounts of profit selling slaves to Europeans but it's very complicated system. However, as the slave trade grew, it allowed Europeans to become more influential in their dealings with Africa. Some Africans would specifically go on slave raiding campaigns in exchange for manufactured European tools. Only way Africans could get guns was through trade with Europeans. Guns would give them an advantage over their neighbors. Hence, in order to protect themselves against neighbors, some had little option but to give away captives for guns. So like, it's the dilemma. If you're a leader now who's on the coast and you're beginning to worry. Now, I don't want to sell so many slaves to the Europeans because I'm worried about the implications this might have long term. You kind of disadvantage yourself because your neighbor that, uh, further away who has no problem selling slaves to Europeans is going to be better armed than you because he's going to get weapons from the Europeans. In Angola, the Portuguese stirred a war between the Congo and the Ndongo. Um, so they even sometimes Europeans would stir up wars between two different groups so that there'll be more conflict and be better able to get slaves. War captives was a major source of slaves for many centuries. Before, but before the Europe, uh, arrival of Europeans, it was possible for them to be incorporated back into society. You know, as we say, all cultures and all peoples at some stage could have kept slaves. So Africans kept other Africans as slaves, Europeans kept Europeans as slaves, Asians kept Asians as slaves. But in those types of slave systems, you could be incorporated back into society. Sometimes you might have to convert to a different religion or work a certain amount of time. Maybe your children might be born free. But what's happening now is this chattel slavery is that once you transported from Africa to Europe, I'm sorry, not to Europe, to the Americas, all the people who are in the Americas, are either Native Americans who are dying in large numbers, European settlers, 
or African slaves. Automatically, in the new world, if you're black, you're a slave. If you're white, you're a slave owner. Now, obviously, I'm generalizing. There's some instances, even in the new world, where slaves own slaves. It's a bit complicated, but generally speaking, that's the situation that develops there. Once you're in the new world, by virtue of being black, you are automatically a slave. It's chattel slavery, and it's very, very rigid. Whereas historically, a slave could be incorporated back into society in the transatlantic slave trade. It's very different. So, as already mentioned, many forms of slavery had existed before the transatlantic slave trade, but often it's not as rigid. Slaves could be incorporated back into society. Some influential individuals were former slave descendants, or, or former slaves or descendants of slaves. Some very famous people historically were actually either born a slave or their parents were slaves, but not with the transatlantic slave trade, because the transatlantic slave trade, once you reach the new world, you're not allowed to become free again. Your children will be slaves or you'll be worked to death. And that's simply by virtue of the color of your skin in the Americas, you're going to become a slave as the transatlantic slave trade starts to develop. However, transatlantic slave trade means chattel slavery, or chattel, the, word for, or the Latin word for cattle. Chattel is the Latin word for cattle. Slaves in the transatlantic slave trade were packed on ships, sent to the Americas like objects. In the Americas, they could be bought and sold. So this is many types of slavery, this is chattel slavery. Slaves are seen as a commodity, not humans. Who, they don't have rights, they're seen as a product, of, like cattle. And they're treated like that, they get sold like that. When they arrive in the new world, the sickliest ones on the board the ship, remember they're packed on a ship. They're thinking, put as many slaves as you can on a ship, send them to the Americas. If you lose some along the way, you still have enough that you generate profits. The cheapest would be, oh, sorry, the, those who were the most starved and most sick were sold first, and the healthiest ones would be sold for higher prices. They were treated as commodities. For three centuries in which Europeans lived in the Americas, Africans became seen as a slave, uh, slaves. And now, I'd say in the 1500s, there was no sense of superiority. Europeans arrived on the West African coast, but in the Americas now, after 300 years of slavery, racism and a sense of superiority is definitely developing. Um, just a point made earlier about the United States of America actually having a very small proportion of slaves sent. You see the stats again, 48% of slaves were sent to the Caribbean, 41% were sent to Brazil, and 5% were sent to the United States of America. In North America, slaves and children who would be owned by plantation owners could either be made to work on plantations or sold to other plantations. In Brazil, slavery was so intense that slaves would die before bearing children and had to constantly be bought from Africa to make up the numbers. So different working lifestyles in the North, in North America, the, the thinking was if you, if you look after your slaves and they have children, those slaves, those children will be valuable. You could make them work or you could sell them and make profit. The thinking in Brazil was you just keep buying slaves. You work them and work them and work them until they, they die. It's cheaper to just buy more slaves. Uh, this is a picture of what it would have looked like when the slave raiders went, just the slave raider over here, he would go in, capture slaves, they would transport the slaves like this to the forts along the west coast of Africa. They would be housed in these forts like prisoners. A uh, European ship would come, they would be packed into those ships, they would be sent across the Atlantic Ocean. They would be packed like this. Again, the thinking, this is a very brutal form of slavery, the thinking wasn't that you know, look after the slaves, let them arrive healthy and, you know, um, strong and able to work. Instead, it was just put as many as you can in the ship. Some are going to die and or get sick. And if they do, they would throw them overboard. And nonetheless, enough would arrive in the new world for you to sell and make your profits. Um, very, very brutal system of slavery. And it would last for 300 years until... Uh, largely a product of the Industrial Revolution, also not to underestimate the efforts of those who campaigned for slavery to come to an end because it's immoral. Uh, Britain would eventually lead the uh, race to end the slave trade and later slavery altogether. And the system of slavery would eventually come to an end. And later, the, as the system of slavery comes to an end, the transatlantic slave trade comes to an end, various parts of the Americas, slaves would be liberated. But the African continent will now be used for a different purpose and colonialism will replace slavery.